Hey there, folks. My name is Misadventure, and welcome to the first episode of the Damasek Campaign. This is going to be a brand new series here on the channel, featuring Imperator Rome and a number of mods. Most prominently, the Bronze Age Reborn Overhaul mod. This is a total conversion mod for Imperator Rome that sets the game about 1700 years earlier in history, back in the Middle Bronze Age, and also has a completely new campaign map closely zoomed in on the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East areas, where civilization was really present during this time period. So definitely quite a different setting and scenario for this campaign. We're going to see as the campaign gets started here just how different things really are in this time period on a whole bunch of different levels. But before we get into the campaign starting itself, some logistic information. First of all, I do want to acknowledge uh, what you may have noticed already, which is a change in my recording audio. I've switched from a standing microphone to a slightly lower quality headset microphone. The main reason for this is I, um, I've been using headphones with my standing microphone and the headphones actually just broke. So I had to get a new pair of headphones and I thought I may as well get a headset because uh, in the last few years as I've recorded with that standing microphone, having to kind of crouch over the microphone for my voice to be loud enough because I speak kind of softly and I just didn't record my voice that audibly. I had to turn the game volume way down to accommodate, but then I could barely hear the game and I could never know how mixed things would be, or what the mixing would be like in the final version of the video. I don't really edit these videos and I generally upload the raw files directly on YouTube, so there's not really like a separate vocal track that I could, you know, modify later on. I don't really have my recording set up like that. So I have to just kind of roll with whatever the audio levels are in the recording file itself. And so, in pursuit of making sure that I don't have, uh, you know, too soft of a voice, um, this switch, which does result in a lower quality vocal audio, and I think my voice sounds a bit um, sort of higher pitched as well. Uh, this is just an effect of the different microphone. Um, but I think it's worth it because the audio should be more consistent as, you know, obviously this is a headset microphone. As I move my head around, the, the microphone's the same distance away from my mouth. so should be more consistently audible misadventure commentary. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe you'd prefer to not hear me talking in these videos, but whatever the case, that's the explanation about that. Uh, I know this is probably a bit of a change, so sorry if uh, you already miss the old baritone misadventure, but he's still here just uh, speaking through a kind of bad microphone, so it is what it is. Now, um, also on the topic of logistics and audio, uh, one mod I want to mention that I'm playing with alongside the Bronze Age Reborn is a mod called Music Player Plus, which is a popular mod on the Steam Workshop. It uh, adds in a bunch of music tracks from other games, movies, and TV shows that have a sort of ancient age theme. So um, most of the tracks I find do fit pretty well with the tone of this game. I, didn't, I haven't caught any tracks that really kick me out of my immersion or whatnot. And there's some absolute bangers, like the Age of Mythology Egypt theme is in here somewhere. So whenever that comes on, a good thing I have this, you know, headset mic, because I'm going to be headbanging away whenever that's playing. So there's definitely some great nostalgic music in here. I, I love um, all the strategy game music from the earlier 2000s, uh, whenever those come on with this mod. So I don't know what this is going to do for the copyright situation. Some of these may be copyrighted. Generally, my Imperator Rome videos uh, never get any copyright notice. Uh, I think the game is so kind of ignored by Paradox, they don't even bother to do copyright policing on YouTube. Not that what I'm doing is copyright infringing. I would argue that, you know, Let's Plays fall generally within fair use. That's a whole complicated legal argument, but I feel pretty confident that uh, the content that I make in the Let's Play sense uh, generally isn't copyright infringing, especially because I don't monetize it. But with this music in the videos, the chance of some rogue copyright holder getting alerted and uh, flagging these videos, it goes up quite a bit. Now again, I don't monetize these videos, so if they if they do monetize it uh, and put ads on them, that's not me doing it, trust me, uh, even if I wanted to put ads on these videos, I couldn't. Uh, so it's just um, the system at work if that does happen. So sorry in advance if you get any advertisements on these videos. I think that the increased music diversity is worth that possibility, so just a heads up about that. Now another mod that I'm playing with alongside the Bronze Age Reborn is a gameplay mod with a pretty big impact on how this campaign is going to play, and I wanted to talk about it here at the very beginning because of how big of a change it actually makes. Now this mod, again, isn't part of Bronze Age Reborn, but I do think it is a good companion mod to Bronze Age Reborn, and that is the No Minimum Levy Size mod. 
Now what this is doing is it tackles the way in this game where your army levy is calculated size-wise based on the cultural population of your nation. So the more people in your nation who are of your culture contribute their manpower to your levy, then the number of cohorts you can raise from any given region is dynamically based on that math. And in the base game and in regular Bronze Age Reborn, there is an exception to this rule on the system level, where every region at minimum has to give you four cohorts, even if that's more than what the cultural population in the region would give you based on the dynamic math. And the result of this is a, an advanced strategy for Imperator Rome play, which I have often referred to as region splitting, where you go out of your way to get territory in as many regions as possible to take advantage of the free four cohorts from these minimum levies. Now, region splitting is a really big part of Imperator Rome, high-level Imperator Rome play. However, I don't really like that, that it's in the game. It doesn't really make any sense what's happening with region splitting. There's no reason why owning a piece of territory in a new region would actually give you four free cohorts of soldiers. That doesn't have any logical explanation in kind of a, a real-world sense. And the way it works in the base game and in regular Bronze Age Reborn basically means that small nations or nations that I, love, that I play, such as in the Zhongnu campaign, in kind of a cheesy way to try to get region splits as often as possible, get a crazy manpower advantage uh, not based on the population mechanics that are in the game, where army size is normally based on that, but just based on taking advantage of this weird exception to the way the, the system normally works. So because the game is based around trying to have your army be dynamically based on your population size, I think the game would be more interesting if that exception to the rule wasn't in effect. And that's what this mod is doing. It turns off that exception to the rule and makes it so that on the system level, every nation in the game, myself, all the AI nations, uh, don't get the four minimum levy cohorts uh, from every region. Instead, you only get the regional population that would join your levy, uh, normally speaking. And so one effect of this is that it slows down the game for everybody, because all of these sort of uh, inexplicable four-cohort armies roaming around are no longer part of the game uh, across the board. Additionally, um, regions that don't have enough population to support four cohorts won't raise four cohorts. And like in the base game in Bronze Age Reborn, you do still need four cohorts to do sieges. So a lot of the time, the AI nations or yourself won't have the manpower to raise enough levies and cohorts to actually even do sieges at the start of the game without making use of mercenaries or allies or whatnot. And this is quite a big change that severely limits many of the AI nations, but I actually think this is pretty fair because this is how it works in real life. If you don't have a large enough population to levy into your army, then that's the end of the, the story and you have to get creative to work around it. This is how famous small nations in real history like Massilia or Syracuse had to use uh, mercenaries and creative methods to survive against larger neighbors. So I think it's perfectly fine in this game to expect yourself or the AI to do that as well without those cheesy uh, minimum four cohort levies at work. So this is definitely going to be a pretty big gameplay change, but one that I think is quite cohesive with the Bronze Age Reborn experience. I've playtested Bronze Age Reborn for about 20 hours or so off camera, and I do think that this mod works pretty well with the setting uh, for quite a number of reasons. So we're going to be exploring how uh, this campaign will work uh, with uh, these mods in effect. One more thing to note on the mod topic, and again, in the description down below, you can find all of the mod information uh, in a bit more detail. I'm also going to be playing, or I am going to be playing, with a modded version of Bronze Age Reborn that I've made some personal tweaks to in the code. I cracked open the mod's code and made some changes just for my personal preference. Trust me, it didn't make the game any easier for me. What I've done is I have gone ahead and made the gameplay, the, the game, a bit more of a sandbox experience by removing all of the pre-existing historic roads and all of the pre-existing historic holy sites. So in the Bronze Age Reborn normally, there is a huge road network in its historic location, and there are a ton of holy sites all over the place in their historic locations. I haven't changed the, like, the mechanics of roads or holy sites. The AI and us can still build uh, roads and holy sites in the normal way, None of that's changed. I just removed the ones that are on the map normally so that the map is a bit more of a blank slate for our hopefully quite long campaign where we can build roads and holy sites where we want to. So with all that being noted, a bit more logistic stuff just to note before we get started here. 
this is going to be a bi-weekly series, so every Wednesday and Sunday at noon. Check back for that. And additionally, um, I'm going to be continuing the Zhang Nu campaign's 55 to 60 minute video length uh, policy. So that's going to be the length of these videos. I have my timer going and all that so I can keep track of that. Whatever the case, let's go ahead and finally 10 minutes and get started with this campaign. So, there is still even more uh, explanation, and I don't think I'll even unpause the game in this first video because there's a ton of setup to do, but at this point, if you watched my content before, you should know to expect that. But before we talk about the starting situation, let's take a look at this incredible map. This is one of the most um, impressive works of map modding I think I've ever seen for a Paradox game. Obviously, the game takes place in a smaller area of the world, but the detail of this map is just absolutely jaw-dropping. I don't even know how they managed to uh, simulate all of these Bronze Age era settlements. So absolutely incredible work, and the more I play this mod, the more I fall in love, honestly. But we're going to be over here in the Middle Eastern area, not in the most fertile parts of the Fertile Crescent or the Egyptian area, but actually here in the Canaan area. Now we're going to be playing as the nation, of course, as uh, Damasek. So here we are, Damasek. I also know, by the way, that it's probably more properly pronounced uh, Damasek because of the way the A has the symbol over it. I think it's called a, a, a circumflex or a circum something. Um, there's some term for that symbol over the A, but I looked up how to pronounce uh, words with this letter because this is a, often a French letter or it's used a lot in the French language. I think it'd be pronounced uh, Damasek to be super accurate, but ultimately this is just the name that the mod has. This place was called many things over history. It is a very, uh, there's a long history with it. Of course, it's modern-day Damascus, uh, famous from the Middle Ages, where it was an important center in Islam. It still is an important center to Islam as well, actually, in the modern day. I think it's the, um, it's not the capital of Syria, but it's an important city in Syria. But whatever the case, uh, we're in a very much pre-Syria era. We're actually in a pre-Assyria era as well, so definitely, uh, quite a ways back in time. Specific, specifically, um, it's a little hard to see because this is glitched, but we're in uh, 2115 BCE. It, it, this is uh, incorrect up here because we're it's the UI. is uh, It's not adjusted for the mod, but trust me, that's the, the date that we're at. It's 2115 BCE or uh, 1st of January 785 YFF. Again, this uh, tooltip here is just from the base game, so that's why that's wrong. But um, yeah, so YFF is years from flood. So we'll talk a bit more about the context of this dating system once we get into the game here. But playing as Damasek, that's how I'm going to be pronouncing it just because that's easier to say, with the Damaseki culture. Let's talk a little bit about our starting situation here. Now, first of all, we are starting as a local power. We have eight territories at the beginning. And as far as I can tell, the mechanics and modifiers of local powers are the same in this mod as they are in the base vanilla Imperator Rome. I didn't spot anything in that list that looked that different than what I would be expecting here. Now, something to note, though, is that the number of territories uh, needed in this mod to advance your power ranking has been increased. So normally, you need 25 territories to be a regional power in the base game. But in this mod, you need 40 territories. So definitely a kind of subtle change, but one that makes advancing your nation uh, take a bit longer. Actually, and this is going to be a recurring thing, a lot of the changes, both in this mod and in my mod order, have the effect of slowing down the pace of the game and giving us kind of a longer-term experience. Uh, so we're going to be definitely enjoying a pretty long campaign here, hopefully. Now, we have the Heritage of Damascus. Of course, that's the modern name of the city. The first signs of inhabitation reach back to 9000 BC. The first permanent residents settled probably around uh, 6300 BC. Thus, Damascus is one of the oldest cities in the world. Just like Halab, their rulers often changed, and usually not because the Damas Damascenes wanted it. So part of why I wanted to play as um, the nation of Damasek specifically, and I may also refer to it as Damascus every so often, but I'll try my best to remember to call it Damasek, because that is what it's called in this time period, and that's the name of the nation as well as the name of the city. Part of, wanted, part of why I wanted to play as Damasek is because of their absolutely goaded heritage. Take a look at this heritage, plus 0.05% national pop growth, that's quite strong, especially for this long-term campaign. One thing I will go ahead and reveal, and this is kind of a fun part about this mod, the Bronze Age Reborn doesn't have a, like, a Bronze Age period end date. The game just keeps going uh, throughout the rest of the Bronze Age, because we're in the middle of Bronze Age. We're about a thousand years before the Bronze Age collapse, and about, you know, 1700 years before the base game. 
So as far as I can tell, this mod actually doesn't have an end date during the Bronze Age. You can play through the rest of the Bronze Age and into the time period of the base game to when the base game has its end date. So we can actually p play for potentially something like 2,000 years, which is crazy to think about, but technically speaking, I think that that's actually possible in this mod. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to be the plan for this campaign, um, but I do want to have this be a nice long campaign with a lot of long-term plans. We're going to talk a bit about our long-term plans later in this episode concerning uh, the, you know, the goals of this campaign, because there are some pretty particular goals here, but we will be just enjoying this mod uh, at a relatively slow pace. Uh, hopefully the uh, the bump in the release schedule that I... Because in the Zhongnu campaign I had weekly uploads. Hopefully the bump to bi-weekly uploads uh, twice a week in this sense does uh, make up for maybe me playing this campaign a bit more in a bit more of a slow pace. So that's my hope with that. But uh, yeah, whatever the case, uh, Pop Growth is going to be a great modifier for that long-term approach. Uh, monthly Civ Change plus 0.03% is also really strong. Um, Civ change is a pretty important modifier in this mod especially, so anything that boosts that up at that kind of deep core level like this is going to really help out. Additionally, the malice for this heritage is honestly not that big of a deal. Fort defense minus 15% is, in my opinion, a fairly uh, weak malice in the sense that it's an unimpactful malice. I think that malices in this game can range from quite impactful, you have to play around that malice, to kind of an unimpactful or weak malice. Not that Fort Defense isn't an important modifier, I just don't think it's a modifier that is so important that I have to change my strategy and my planning around that modifier being changed. So that's what I consider to be a weak malice, is one that uh, sort of triggers a, a less uh, you know, intense reaction from the player to kind of accommodate it. So definitely a pretty strong heritage to be sure. We're playing as an autocratic monarchy with our king, Ipter Dagon I Abarid. I'm going to take a look at him in just a moment here, but autocratic monarchies confer absolute power, and the title is hereditary. So we get one military, one civic, and one religious idea. We, of course, have lifelong ruling leaders with a consort that provides consort benefits. And if you don't remember the way it works um, in this game, consorts lend to their uh, partner, who is the ruler, um, they're higher stats, but only to the extent that the stats have a national effect. So, for example, um, our ruler has 6545, and uh, zeal, one of the effects of zeal on the nation, is the, na the national impact of the ruler's zeal is omen power. So, or I believe it's omen power, it might be religion happiness, one of those uh, religion modifiers, but let's say that it's omen power, just as an example. I don't remember offhand, we're going to find out in a moment. Um, if Ipter Dagon has a wife who has 10 zeal, then the omen power bonus of the 10 zeal is what the nation enjoys um, because she's lending to him her, her modifier from her zeal. Now, where this doesn't happen is when it comes to the offices that your ruler is involved in. So, for example, Ipter Dagon is going to be the governor of our starting region with his 5 finesse. And let's say that he has a 10 finesse wife. Now, the, nation effect, the national effect of his finesse is from the wife's 10 finesse, because it's the consort's finesse. But his governorship is his personal office, so he brings his personal finesse to the office. So his governorship only draws from his 5 finesse. And similarly, being a general, Ipter Dagon only can bring his 6 marshal. If he has a really high marshal wife, that affects the, na the national modifiers from high marshal but his generalship, he only uses his own personal six marshal. So I tend to think that the consort bonuses are helpful, but not game-changing, and you can't really get around a really terrible ruler with really low marshal, especially, and finesse to some extent. Um, but ultimately, Ipter Dagon is a pretty well-rounded character. He's not great in anything, but he's also not terrible in anything, and his lowest stat, Charisma, I do think is the least important stat for... Uh, leaders in this game, but whatever the case. Now, if we match up our ideas, we do get 6% uh, slave output, which is quite nice, and we do have 15% uh, civ level by default. Now, you may be wondering about that 40% assault power reduction modifier. That's actually something that's on the system level for the entire Bronze Age Reborn mod. Every nation has this modifier, essentially to discourage the mechanic of using siege assaults, for various reasons that are kind of too complicated to discuss at length right here. But basically, it seems as though the mod authors uh, believe that siege assaults uh, weren't very common in this time period, which, as far as I can tell, is uh, what we understand about the time period, is that siege, sieges in general and siege assaults weren't that common. 
So I actually don't mind this change. It also, again, contributes to the, the broader theme of slowing down the pace of the game. Siege Assaults are often easy to kind of cheese, making use of local allies being present for the siege, uh, even temporarily, to get them involved in the assault. So having to do sieges yourself, especially with the changes to minimum levies from my other mod, is going to make uh, this game feel a bit slower paced and a bit more kind of long-term grand strategy, which of course is the whole point of playing a game like this. I'm not here to have quick bursts of exciting, you know, decisive moments. Uh, it's more about the long-term strategy with those occasional things happening still, but it's more about the planning and the execution than it is the moment-to-moment -moment decision making. So, all that being noted, we have the Canaanite religion. In terms of the bonuses, I think the Canaanite religion is one of the weaker religions bonus-wise in this campaign, but it is still pretty good. All the religions do have good bonuses in this in this mod. Uh, morale of navies 10%, not very useful for our very landlocked start, but we will eventually have navies, so we'll take advantage of that once we get there. And of course, that's very thematic for the, the later history of the Phoenicians, who of course were Canaanite. The base food capacity 350 is handy, especially given our outrageously lush starting situation. We're in, in an area of oasises all over the place, and oasises are extremely powerful tiles that might be the best tile in the game for cities, especially in this mod. So we're going to have potentially an absolutely just packed uh, home province with a ton of cities, enormous infrastructure, and having lots of food capacity is going to really help for that, because as, as we'll see a bit later in this episode, there are some changes to the food system in this mod to make food a bit more of an important mechanic, especially early on. Loyalty of characters plus five is quite a nice bonus, as this just helps you avoid uh, those edge case characters edging into to disloyalty. In my experience playtesting the Bronze Age Reborn off camera, I have found that family heads seem to have even more power base than normal and are even harder to deal with. So we're going to be very, very carefully micromanaging, particularly family heads, but also just characters with high power base uh, throughout this campaign. And the loyalty bonus from Canaanite does help out with that quite a bit, as these flat loyalty bonuses just kind of move the goalpost of, of how much you can exploit and abuse your nobles before they start to get disloyal. So the polytheistic Canaanite religion was worshipped by those living in the ancient Levant. It was headed by El and Asherah, and a complex hierarchy of lesser gods, which were often worshipped at shrines found on mountains or hilltops. Right. So lastly, as I noted earlier, we are of Damaseki culture, and again, I'm not sure how to pronounce this exactly. This term doesn't have the, the symbol over the A, so I don't know if this would be pronounced differently than how the other thing would be pronounced, but Damaseki sounds fine. Again, calling this the Damasek campaign as well. Now, we're in the Canaanite culture group, so that is easy enough to remember given that we are Canaanite religion, so that's fine. The Canaanite culture group is uh, living here in the sort of desert area that we live in, but otherwise it's mostly on the coastline of the Mediterranean, with the um, area over here, which is also Canaanite religion, being the, the Sinai Palestinian people down here. So just a heads up about that. We're also kind of nearby some of these uh, Amorite areas. The Amorites are, I think, the native people of sort of northern Iberia, and they also live up here in these river areas. But whatever the case, we're in an area nearby some cultural diversity, or some culture group diversity. There's a lot of cultural diversity in this mod. Almost every nation has its own culture in this mod, and of course, uh, being uh, Damasek, we have the Damaseki culture. So whatever the case, uh, that's the starting situation there. Now, as noted earlier, we have Ipter Dagon the first Averid with his 6545. 27 years old. We're going to take a look at his uh, traits and family uh, in a moment here. And as noted earlier, we have eight territories at the start, 50 Canaanite Damas Damaseki population, so quite a strong starting population. We shouldn't actually uh, have any problems with uh, being below the starting levy uh, in this campaign, which is quite convenient. Although we're going to see some of our neighbors may have those problems, so shouldn't affect us at the start, but uh, once we get new regions, we will be noticing uh, a lack of any default levy cohorts uh, because of that mod. Right, with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started here. I'm not going to play in Iron Man mode this time. I've been doing this uh, for all my campaigns until this one. I think after what happened with the previous campaign, uh, even though um, Iron Man mode does make it easier by autosaving for you, I'd rather just make multiple save files and just have backup saves just in case there's some you know, really um, just unfortunate situation where a, a reload is called for. I'm not going to do any save scumming in this campaign. Um, and in the past when I've played the game, you know, on my own, I play Iron Man to avoid the temptation of save scumming. But then I thought about it and realized, you know, I'm playing this game 
live, not live, but I'm playing it, you know, in a live recording for an audience of hundreds, I couldn't get away with save scumming even if I tried to, right, in this campaign, so I don't need to worry about the temptation to save scum. I'm literally creating video evidence of this campaign, so if I were to save scum, people would notice and call me out. So whatever the case, no Iron Man mode for this campaign. Also, mixed gender rules turned off. I strongly assume that these people are not going to have a uh, mixed gender uh, culture because they are Canaanite, but whatever the case, we'll see what they do. Um, I assume that we're going to have a patriarchal system with only male officers. It's going to make the game a little bit harder for sure, but uh, that's just another mechanic for us to worry about. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the Domasek campaign. All right, the 4.2 kilo year event. Starting a few decades ago, much of the world has been struck by a devastating drought that has caused the collapse of the Akkadian Empire, the Egyptian Old Kingdom, and the Luangshu culture in the Far East. It is a time of social upheaval and destruction of sacred sites and great migrations of people seeking better lands. We must navigate these treacherous waters with great care. So we must endure. As we can see here, the entire known world is suffering from a several decade long drought with a more severe one in Egypt. So we get minus 25% local monthly food modifier across the world, more of this in Egypt as well. Now it's actually worse than this if we look at our land here. Uh, we can see here, yeah, so we get minus 35% um, at the moment, or actually for the rest of the game, it's not just at the moment. Uh, minus 0 0.06 monthly civ level as well, uh, so that's quite a substantial effect. Fortunately, our national heritage is kind of diminishing this a little bit, but we are going to see a general trend around this, this map of civilizational decline and food shortage problems. Now, we're not exactly dealing with the Bronze Age collapse here. This is, uh, of course, uh, about a thousand years before the Bronze Age collapse, but potentially there may be some events uh, once we get there that uh, simulate that. I don't actually know. I haven't gotten that far in the campaign yet, so we shall see. And increased tribesman desired ratio everywhere, for what that's worth. Right. Now, first of all, as I noted earlier, we are in 1st of January, 785 in the YFF time system. So basically what's going on here is the game, so that it can count up instead of counting down, it's using this system that's years from flood, and that's the flood that swept over Mesopotamia in 2900 BCE. So uh, that's basically the origin of this YFF system. Uh, I'll try my best not to call it the YIF time system for obvious reasons, but I may uh, accidentally call it that. Try to just refer to it as YFF. So we're in 2115 BCE uh, in terms of BCE timeline. Um, I wish that there was a way to have um, both the YFF and the BCE times displayed, but I couldn't figure out a way to make that mod work with this. So whatever the case, uh, we'll just proceed here with that in mind. Noting as well, by the way, that 1st of January is going to be our uh, our dates to pause the game every 5 and 10 years for Omens and War Councils, respectively, so definitely kind of nice change from 1st of October, which was just kind of such a random time to remember, to 1st of January, which is a bit more sensible as an important date to pause on. Right, now, let's talk a bit more about our starting situation. So here we are with Damasek. Uh, now, we are in the absolutely goaded Damascus Oasis province. This might be one of the best provinces in the game. Uh, maybe not the best ever, uh, but it is very strong. We have, obviously, Damasek is in an oasis, Irben is in an oasis, Duma is oasis and riverside, like Damasek, Marba is oasis and riverside, and then out here we do have some marshes and plains, but this little core of oasises are very, very, very lush locations, and we actually are next to another really, really strong province over here, the Fijay Spring uh, province, which also has just a ton of oasis is all by this riverside. This actually might be a little technically better than the Damasek area, but it's a bit more in a weird spot because of these mountains. Whatever the case, this is a very, very nice area of the um, the Middle East to be located within with all these uh, rivers and oasises, so definitely quite a strong starting location for us. We do have a presence in both of these locations here, with obviously Damascus Oasis as our capital province in Fijay Spring being one that we are located in as well. And these are both within the Harriman uh, region, and that's going to be our home region for this campaign, at least uh, at the moment. I don't have any plans to move my capital ever from Damasek, because this is obviously uh, the name of the campaign, it's the name of our culture. It seems appropriate to keep it as our uh, capital in the long term. But I will talk for a second now about the, the goals of the campaign, just to kind of reveal my thinking here. Now it has to do with our formables, so We'll talk about the kingdom stuff in the top three rows in a moment here. 
Uh, the first thing we're going to aim to do is unite the Aramean people. And this is going to require, we can see on the uh, the map here, these locations. Yeah, I think you can see it like this. Okay, this is easy to see for Atlas mode. So this is going to require owning these locations here. They're basically all within, or they're mostly within the Hermon region. There's a couple down here in the Jordan Rift Valley as well, but they're mostly around this area here. So essentially, this is trying to simulate the kind of convoluted history of the Aramean uh, Damascan kingdom. It's, I don't know the history super well, but basically the Aramaeans are a Semitic people, so they're not the people who live up here. They're, they came from the south, I believe. And they, uh, they took over this area, but not in this period in history, but later on. Wh whatever the historical context is, the formable is to change our, is to become the nation of Aram. So we are going to be going for that. We're going to keep calling the campaign the Damaset Campaign, even once our name changes to Aram, because this is a really sensible nation to form uh, with our starting location in mind. So we do get some great bonuses for this. It's a Tier 2 formable, so we can't do any other Tier 2 formables. Or, uh, yeah, change our name to Aram. We get 8 population. Uh, Damasek gets a pretty good emergent capital bonus for the rest of the game, two free province investments as well. Now that's the sort of short-term goal, this is the early game is to form a ROM. Once we do that, then we approach the long-term goal of the campaign, which is unite the Canaanites. Now this is going to be quite a big endeavor, as this does involve taking on most of the Canaanite people in the world, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, well, I guess we're also missing out on Cyprus, but whatever the case, all the mainland Canaanites. Now this is a pretty good area for the foundation of an, a Canaanite empire, and if we do this option we do change our name to, to Canaan, and we get uh, 8 population, tier 3 formidable, center of civilization, and Damasek for the rest of the game, which is amazing, 2 free province investments. So this is the long term goal, is to form Canaan. Now my thinking here is that this is an area that never really had a single local native empire like that. Um, Historically, as far as I'm aware, I'm not an expert in ancient history. As far as I'm aware, uh, Canaan was mostly ruled by foreigners. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, the... Um, uh, who was here? I think Babylon was here at one point. Uh, Egypt ruled over here for a long time. And then later on, Persia ruled over here, the Antigonids. And just throughout history, um, there were occasionally times, usually from uh, the ancient kingdoms of Israel, where the locals did rule over the area, but generally there wasn't really a big, powerful empire with its center in Canaan until this campaign. We're going to be forming that empire ourselves from up here in Damasek. Um, we are technically, you know, in the... well, I mean, not just technically. We're in the middle of the Canaanite area, and we're basically kind of technically at the very edge of the Unite the Canaanites sort of territory that it's targeting here. Oh, there's that Age of Mythology soundtrack, yes! <laughs> I, yeah, the, the music player is going to play these uh, these other songs from other games, and I love this song. I don't know if you can hear it very well, but whatever the case, um, this is going to be our long-term decision. Once we click this, I'm going to consider us to have achieved our mid-game goals. So early game is to form Aram, mid-game goal is to form Kanan. And I say mid-game goal because there's actually even more to do beyond this. Not missions, but more kind of conceptual goals for the campaign. I want to not just form a Canaanite empire, but to actually play out the entire experience of being a Bronze Age empire in a world that's going to have, at that point in time, other Bronze Age empires. As time progresses here, other nations will obviously conquer and grow and whatnot. And by the time we're forming the Canaan Empire, I want to see the beginning of those Bronze Age empires that can start to have conflict with each other. And we can be at this crossroads of the world, right in the middle of the map, honestly, and play a role in maybe Egyptian politics, play a role in kind of the Sumerian area, maybe even over here in the Greek area, a bit further away, try to control the copper over here on uh, Kypros, Cyprus. So yeah, we'll see what happens, but definitely some pretty cool long-term plans for the campaign. And it's in an area that I haven't really played in yet. Um, obviously on this on this mod, all these areas are new, but I've definitely not played in this kind of area. And uh, yeah, it will be kind of cool to play as a kind of early proto-Phoenician before that culture even really existed. Um, yeah. Whatever the case. So with all that being said, let's start talking about our starting situation a bit more in terms of our nation. So let me first uh, let me think away. There we go. Right, so those are all the formables. Now, as for these kingdoms, um, in this mod, um, all of the autocratic kingdoms, because all the kingdoms are autocratic, can ascend into these other kinds, but only once they have a certain size and they have certain civilizational laws. We're going to talk about civilizational laws in just a moment. But these are not going to be options we're going to be pursuing for quite a while. We will eventually probably adopt one of these, but not for uh, quite a while, as you can tell. We need to have quite a lot of stuff unlocked. 
or for those. Now, one thing I will do, and we're going to go through this whole list of things a little bit out of order, because first, I'm going to go over to my Civilization Advancement Tree. So this is something that's added by the Bronze Age Reborn mod. This is basically a Bronze Age tech tree. Now, this mod doesn't remove the normal tech tree, so this is also still available and is going to be a big part of this campaign. All of the stuff is going to be a bit anachronistic, because this is all describing stuff from like 2,000 years in the future from when this game is taking place right now. But the Bronze Age tech tree is a bit more uh, sort of period appropriate, so we're just not going to worry too much about all the descriptions of things in this in this mod from the game, from the base game being anachronistic. It is what it is. So basically the way this works is you get civilization technology points, and you get two of them when all of your normal techs go up a level. So you get these really slowly is the, the big takeaway here. You have to spend them very precisely, and there are a lot of things to spend them on. Every category has a sort of level up this category button, and you all start at sort of one out of four, which has no effect. Now we do start with one in writing. We get uh, national tax income from that, and 5% uh, country slip level. Here's a good example where you can see that the top thing is a bonus that's specific to that level, and then the bottom thing is a stacking bonus. We get 5% per level of writing advancement, and we get 10% national tax from just that first one bureaucratic script. Now. There's obviously a lot of very difficult choices to make here. We have to be pretty precise here because these are all very strong and give very big bonuses. But I actually already know the one that I want to go for right at the start here. And that's actually this one here, Bureaucracy 1. And that's because this unlocks three new ideas for each of our idea categories. That's why I'm doing this before I do my idea picking, which is normally something I do first. Because uh, this unlock, because all the ideas in this mod are completely rebalanced. And a lot of the better ideas are actually in that sort of second tier that this unlocks. So we're going to go ahead and grab Bureaucracy 1. This is a pretty big uh, thing to trade off with because we're missing out on really good ones like trade missions for dip range and capital import routes. All of these are really strong, honestly. But I do think ultimately that for a number of reasons, Bureaucracy 1 is the best way to spend our starting save tech point. And we're going to eventually get more uh, technology, level up our tech tree, and get more of these points uh, for use later on. So regional divisions it is unlocks three new ideas of each type, with 5% country civ level uh, being the stacking bonus down here, so that's quite nice. Okay, so with that being done, let's actually go back over here and take a look at these ideas. So we do want to probably match up these ideas, uh, because slave output 6% is quite a strong bonus, but we will go ahead and actually take a look here. You can see that we've got the three standard and then three more. You may also notice that these are all switched around and have different modifiers. Basically, you can think of this as a whole new set of ideas from the mod with only a couple of them being the same as the base game. So to be thorough, I'm going to go through the oratory ideas first, because we don't have an oratory idea slot, just to see if there's one that's worth getting outside of the proper slot in case there's a really, really standout oratory idea. So if that were to be the case, it would probably be sanction privileges. I think monthly corruption reduction is a really strong modifier, because there's not a lot of ways to reduce corruption quickly, so having it just tick down constantly is often quite smart. That being said, I don't think this is better than the other ideas that are matching, and it would I don't think it's worth it to miss out on slave output 6% just for the corruption, so we'll come back to that later if we need to. Strategic propaganda is pretty strong, but again, it's not necessarily game-changing, so it may not be worth leaving uh, the idea track for that. Hospitium is not very strong, so I'm not going to even worry about that. Military administration looks strong, but actually isn't strong, especially compared to the other one, that's very similar, which is uh, functional bureaucracy. The reason for this, by the way, is we're in a pre-Legion period of the campaign. We can uh, get laws through that Civ idea uh, tech tree that unlock the different ty types of legions and whatnot. Uh, so we can later on have legions, but initially we're going to be dealing with levies quite extensively. And with levies, um, one problem we're going to have is levies are led by governors. And so if we were to have military administration, the generals get 10 loyalty, I mean admirals, that they always have the 10 loyalty, but when our governors are raised with their levy and they become a general, they get the 10 loyalty, but then when they're lowered from their levy, they lose the 10 loyalty. So this can actually be a double-edged sword, as if you aren't paying attention, you can actually lower a governor into disloyalty by uh, lowering their levy without thinking about it, and governors with disloyalty are really difficult to deal with, so I don't think this is a really good idea. Functional bureaucracy is strong in that regard, because uh, a governor that's acting as a general for their levy is actually still acting as a governor at the same time, so they actually keep this 10 loyalty at all times. But I don't think this is better than uh, sanction privileges, and I don't think sanction privileges is better than the other ideas for matching up the slots, so not necessarily going to go for that. 
Lastly, legislative reform is pretty strong as well, but again, I don't think it's worth going outside of our idea track. So we're not going to do that uh, in this campaign, at least not for now. We can, of course, switch our ideas around as time goes on. Now, for the military idea, there's a couple good options here. So, martial ethos is typically what I go for. In this mod, it's 10% morale of armies, a very strong bonus and pretty hard to argue against, but there is one later in the military idea slot that I do think is better than this, although uh, only uh, just a bit. Um, they're both quite strong. So, we'll come back to martial, martial ethos at the end for that comparison. Ordered Retreat uh, is a pretty good alternative, but it's not as strong as Martial Ethos in my opinion. Um, situations this might be better than Martial Ethos, but normally I think having higher morale is almost always the best option. Uh, Thalassocracy is interesting, but uh, and it would pair with our, with our Canaanite bonuses quite well. However, we don't really have a navy. We're very landlocked at the minute, and we do not have access to any coastline, and we won't for quite a while, so... We will eventually become a sea power, but not for now. Um, that's going to be more of a, a Canaan er, you know, era event, more than a um, uh, more than a, a Damasek era event, if that makes sense. So this is good, but not for the start of this campaign. Permanent shipyards, similarly, this is a strong bonus, but not for the start of this campaign. So we're not going to go for that. Siege training is actually quite a bit stronger because of that mod that I have removing minimum levies. Siege ability affects your siege ticks, so this is actually quite a stronger bonus in this particular setup with the mods that I have. That being said, it's still not as good as what we will be going for, which is conscription. 10% national manpower is just impossible to beat. This is such a powerful bonus, because as I've talked about in previous uh, campaigns I've done when I've talked about this stuff, the way that the math works is that manpower recovery is a modifier that is a percentage of or is kind of derived from national manpower which is itself a modifier that's derived from freeman output and tribesman output because those are the types of pops that give you manpower and if you're playing as a tribe uh, generally you want tribesmen for manpower if you're playing as not a tribe you want freeman for manpower so we're going to go for a freeman oriented nation in this campaign to get our manpower so conscription really improves your military capability because ultimately um, even if you have lower morale or whatnot, you can almost always work around the morale stuff just by paying for more morale through your economy or making use of just more numbers for mercenaries. Like, generally speaking, I think that manpower and numbers and whatnot just really add a lot of security to your nation, and I think that conscription is a stronger bonus ultimately than martial ethos. It is a close call, and martial ethos would be more helpful in battles, obviously, but I do think that having more manpower and getting this going early on is going to really help us bank up a lot of manpower, which is going to be necessary for taking on all of our neighbors. So I'm going to go for conscription in this campaign, at least at the beginning here. So mandated military service for all those considered mature is not only a duty, it is a privilege. Right, my king, we've adopted the idea of conscription. Our nation will henceforth follow a new course through history. Next for the civic idea. So we've got a couple options here. Standardized construction does what you think it does, so build cost and time reductions. This is handy, but not worth a full slot, honestly. Um, anything that's a one-time cost, like build cost, tends to not be that big of a deal compared to things like maintenance. Uh, complex tariffs is quite strong. I think it's a bit weaker than from the base game, especially in this campaign and with this map, because of how far apart everybody is, and the general lack of uh, international trade at this point in time. So whatever the case, uh, this is not going to be what we go for at this point. Central Urban Spaces is really strong, but I don't think it's as good as something else later in the Civic Ideas. So Province Loyalty plus 0.05 is helpful, but not game-changing, and that's actually not that much when you have a, a province that has like minus 9, or rather minus 0.9 per month loyalty, or something like that. You can really uh, not get a lot of bonus from this. This really just kind of helps edge everything up a little better into loyalty. Tax farming is probably what we're going to go for. Slave output 20% is really strong, and it's going to stack as well additively with our slave output bonus from having matched ideas. So we're going to be focusing a lot on micromanaging our slave economy to get the most amount of tax. If you can't tell already, I'm planning to do a more tax economy-oriented campaign. In previous campaigns, I've really tried to aim at a commerce economy with exporting. We will certainly have exports and imports in this campaign as well, but because of my new approach to how I'm going to get a lot of manpower from Freeman, Freeman also produce tax, and so do slaves, so I may as well have a tax-oriented economy with a big boost in my strategy towards Freeman and slaves to get the most amount of tax and manpower possible. So I think that is going to be pretty cohesive there. 
Now just to be thorough, our other options here are patronized trading posts for three more capital import routes. Definitely quite strong, but early on you don't really have a lot of great trades available. This is really going to be helpful much, much later when you're a big empire that has a ton of diplomatic range. The way that this map is sort of structured, by the way, is I believe it's the same size as the base in Peridorum map. It's just the obviously the terrain has been changed to represent it being more zoomed in, but the the game calculates the distance the same. So the game thinks that we're dealing with like a larger amount of territory compared to what you think it is by just looking at the location and thinking about the real world world size of that makes sense. So another way of saying this is the distance between you know Egypt and Crete in normal Imperator Rome is some distance. In this mod, that distance isn't the distance in in this mod because it's like. Like in this mod, the distance would be like like here, if that makes sense. Because it's using the same size of map, it's just a new amount of terrain to represent it being zoomed in. So basically all that is to say, all the mechanics that use distance, like the, the trade range, are all nerfed a lot on this map. I hope that kind of made sense, but I don't know if I'm explaining it very well. Whatever the case, um, all that to be said, patronized trading post isn't a strong early game, because you just don't have a lot of stuff to trade for, so we're not going to go for that. Grain stockpile is quite strong and, and pairs up really well with our Canaanite bonus to having more food capacity. But again, early game, I don't really think we're going to have food shortages, even though we have a very uh, a lot of potential here in our core for a lot of cities. We only have one city currently at Damasek directly, so there's no danger of having like too much people eating all of our food. At the moment, all these oases are going to be producing a lot of food with no people to eat it, so not going to have food shortages for quite a while here. So all that being said, I think tax farming is the way to go, for the reasons I talked about earlier. By shifting responsibility for tax collection to third parties, we can uh, make far greater budget calculations, as well as avoid certain unfortunate responsibilities. Right, now down here in the religious ideas, there's one really strong religious idea. I know I've got a, this has been my recurring statement, but I do think there is a pretty good standout from each category. So for the religious ideas, the one that isn't going to be what we go for is institutional proselytism. This is really strong under certain circumstances, but at the moment we actually are in the middle of the Canaanite area, even though the cultural groups are quite different around here. Everybody around here is all on the same page about being Canaanite. So there's not really any need for religious uh, conversion. If this were uh, cultural assimilation, I would go for it, but that's not what this says. Uh, monthly war exhaustion, minus 0.05. Definitely a good bonus, but not really necessary uh, most of the time. I think as long as I'm, especially with the slower pace of the game, we're not going to really have war exhaustion and aggressive expansion problems the way we did in the previous campaign, where I played at a really fast pace uh, in the Zhongnu campaign. Mandated Observance is a very, very strong bonus, but probably not the one I'm going to go for, because there's an even better one later on in the Religious Idea area. But this is definitely a very strong contender, especially with our, our Religious Unity, we have a very powerful Omen to work with. That being said, there is, again, an idea later on in the same idea section that I do think is a bit better, so we're not going to go for this, but we may go for it later, depending on the circumstances. Haruspicy isn't very good, so I'm not going to go for that. I will be going for Tolerance of Pagans, Integrated Culture Happiness 15%. This basically means that our integrated cultures, which, uh, unless we do integration, which we're not going to, only is referring to um, the people, the native people of uh, Damasek, the Damaseki. This basically makes all of our Damaseki 15% happier, which is a game-changing bonus. That means all of the Damaseki freemen especially have increased happiness, which means more output. And generally speaking, because we're going we're gonna to go for a hard assimilation approach, we're going to be making everybody Damaseki and then boosting their happiness a ton with Tolerance of Pagans. Now just to be thorough, our last option here is State Religion. This is also a pretty good uh, option, but I don't think it's as good as Tolerance of Pagans. And if this wasn't 15, if this was only 10%, I'd probably go for Mandated Observance, but I do think 15 makes it high enough that I'm willing to overlook Omen Power. Especially because you sometimes will have omen, your Omen be set to something like Manpower Recovery Speed, where that extra little boost there isn't as important all the time. But Culture Happiness has such a great knock-on effect, especially if we start playing around with stability. If we're switching around our Omens and, and doing stuff that lowers our stability, uh, stability's main impact is on happiness, so affecting... Uh, you're keeping your own native culture as happy as possible really helps you in so many ways. So tolerance of pagans it is. The number of pagan, hybrid, or purely foreign religions making their way into our territory is vast. Allowing individuals the right to privately practice their own religion is sure to result in a more tolerant society. 
Alright, so now we have the uh, National Slave output plus 6%, so that is quite handy. Incidentally, we actually do start with... Um, actually, I was on the screen already. We only start with one slave, so not much of a slave economy at this point. It's just one guy, or one community of guys. But better than nothing, and we will get some more slaves as time progresses here. Right, also, our starting province does have uh, Encourage Trade in effect, which is probably fine to maintain for now. And then Acquisition of Wealth is perfectly fine, so that is fine. That all being said, let's go over here and look at our government. So we do have a consort here for Iptur Dagon I. His serene consort, Tabua. This is Tabua uh, Milkramid. So she is his... Uh, let's see here. She's eight years his junior, uh, 19 years old, so they have a kid together. They have a one-year-old kid named Arashat Aberid, so that is a daughter down there. All right, uh, look at the backdrop. She's uh, literally... Uh, hovering over the Nile there, or whatever that river is. I guess it's not the Nile, but the river by um, Damasek. So, all right, we have a daughter, that's fine. Um, I guess this technically means we have a succession crisis, because we probably... Yes, we only allow male successors. We can change this later, but my king is so young, I don't think we need to change this right now. Um, that would just cost PI and stability for kind of no immediate purpose, really. So we'll worry about that later. Uh, whatever the case, though... Um, so my character, Ipter Dagon, uh, in terms of traits, he is loving, which is quite nice. So one more diplomatic relation uh, for the nations, that could be kind, kind of handy, especially if we switch off of neutral stance, which I plan to. Uh, one more friend available to him, and he has a bit more charisma. So a warm heart and kind gaze can always be found with Ipter Dagon. He's also arrogant, so that's an interesting combination. A monthly PI minus 0.25 is painful. Yeah, wow, that is actually very painful. This might be my least favorite trait for Ruler because of the PI reduction. Fortunately, the Loyalty Malice doesn't have any effect because he's the Ruler, and he's not just a, a character in the nation. Reduce Charisma from that, increase Prominence, which doesn't matter. Yeah, this might be the worst trait for Ruler because Charisma doesn't matter. Um, the Prominence, uh, if they're the Ruler, is already at 100, and Loyalty doesn't matter. And then the Monthly PI, minus 0.25. That's not even a percent modifier. That's just a flat number modifier. Ouch. We're definitely going to have to set him to Scheme Influence, but that's not even going to really fix the problem. We're going to have a PI problem while this guy's in charge, that's for sure, so we'll worry about that later. In terms of his, of his wife, Tabwa, who's also, of course, uh, Damaseki, as you would expect, she's a founder, apparently, so Tabwa... Actually, you know what? I did not read this guy's uh, lore here. Ipter Dagon is quite simply the best at everything he puts his hand to. All right, anyways, back over to Tabwa. So, Tabua has visions the likes of which have not been seen since the days of Solomon, Romulus, or the great pharaohs of old. Um, at least Romulus and the pharaohs are after this, or the Romulus is at least, so whatever the case. So some more anachronistic event descriptions and whatnot, you're going to see this a lot. Um, in terms of the effects it'll have for her being the consort, nothing actually from this, so that's fine. Uh, greedy reduces her charisma. Nobody would ever d dare accuse Tabua of moderation or self-control. More likely to engage in theft. Well, I guess she's stolen my heart, so that kind of makes sense. And then our daughter has no traits, because she's one. Okay, that's fine by me. Um, right, so uh, she is lending us, uh, Tabo, I mean, is lending us her seven finesse and her six zeals. So that is uh, helping a little bit, although not by much. So we're ending up with uh, the marshal for the nation is six, so we see the bonuses there. Finesse is seven with those bonuses. Charisma is still going to be going to be his bad charisma with those bonuses. And then zeal. So I guess zeal doesn't affect omen power or omen duration or whatnot. Actually, I know it doesn't affect omen duration, what I'm trying to say. Omen power or religious happiness. Uh, same... What, what is... What is the modifier called? Hold on. Literally, what is it called? State religion happiness. That's what it is. Not the same religion happiness. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the case, uh, that is fine. We're going to do the War Council, because it is the 1st of January, 785, but we're not going to do that quite yet. First, I'm going to go ahead and actually reorganize our offices, kind of like what I did in the Zhongnu campaign. Although I think what I'm going to do is actually do that at the start of the next episode, because I don't want to go... Uh, oops, I must unpause there. I don't want to go too late into the episode and, and risk going over my hour marks. I think it will take a bit of time to get these guys reorganized. I don't really want to be rushing that. But whatever the case, that's going to be it for the start of the Damaset campaign. This has been a very technical and kind of dense first episode with a lot of explanation and planning. But as you can tell, I do have a long-term goal with this campaign that I hope will be pretty fun to watch. Uh, I'm hoping that this can be a really fun sandboxy campaign with just a lot of potential for directions to go in. 
and eventually uh, quite a, lar a large number of episodes ahead. I feel like a lot of my campaigns um, get a little bit too uh, kind of out of out of control, out of hand, and with this one I want to play a bit more slowly, play a bit more precisely, and really feel like I'm just kind of having fun with this game. Ultimately, that's my whole goal with this channel, is to just play games and have fun. And although, you know, I want to make a good series that people will enjoy, I'm hoping that I can have a fun time, but that people will enjoy me having fun, and not just enjoy, a, you know, a crazy technical hard campaign, or a campaign with a really difficult start, like the Monopia or the Zhongnu campaign. So with all that being said, I hope that you've enjoyed this first episode of this brand new Bronze Age Reborn campaign. Very, very excited to see where this goes. Let me know in the comments what you think about the uh, the Domasek start and my plans for the campaign, and what you think about the mods I'm playing with in general. I'm very curious to hear if you have experience with the Bronze Age Reborn, or the no minimum uh, garrison, or rather the no minimum levy size mod as well. So let me know in the comments if you do have some experience with that and what your takes are on that. Very interested to hear about that. Whatever the case, thank you all so much for watching this first episode of the Domasek campaign, and I'll see you all next time.